am uh, Björn Pettersson from Lund University, Sweden. I will share some thoughts about ethics in relation to Raimo Tuomela's social ontology. So according to Tuomela, a collective G consisting of some persons is a we mode social group if and only if G has accepted as a certain ethos E as a group for itself and is committed to it. Every member of G group normatively ought to accept E as a group member and accordingly to be committed to it as a group member, at least because, in part because the group has accepted E as its ethos and it's mutually believed in the group that these two conditions are fulfilled. A paradigmatic we mode group, says Tuomela, is not only democratic in that it <coughs> itself can determine its ethos and try to promote it, but it's also autonomous in the sense that the members may freely enter or exit the group conditionally on their participating or ceasing to participate in the collective acceptance and promotion of the ethos. Thus, a paradigmatic we mode group is open relative to its actual and potential members. Non-paradigmatic we mode group Groups, the group ethos may in part be externally determined and members may be less free to enter or exit the group. But even in paradigmatic remote groups, special, special conditions, he says, may concern individuals who have made explicit agreements or contracts in their capacity as group members, yet the members typically need the permission of the other members to rescind their commitment once more specific goals and intentions have been accepted for the group, since the feature of group normativity binds the members strongly together around a shared ethos. This requirement for permission to leave has worried some. The worry is that the analysis does not grant members in we mode groups personal autonomy, at least not sufficiently so. So here is a quote from Corlett and Lyon Strobel from an article in 2017. To the extent that we mode group membership requires the consent of even anyone else in the group for one to either say resign membership or in some other way exit the group, in what sense is genuine personal autonomy preserved in Tuomala's analysis? And how reasonable is it to suppose that anyone not lacking in self-respect would even consider joining such a group if this crucial property of personal autonomy is either absent or significantly diminished? It amounts to group membership without a right to either to defect or resign membership on one's own. And this seems more akin to membership in a street gang or prison gang or the mafia than it does a group that values personal autonomy and rights that exist beyond the social rights that are granted by the group. Autonomy can be used, the, the term autonomy can be used in various different ways and in this Context, it may be useful to distinguish very roughly, at least between autonomy as an actual ability to exercise one's capacity for self-determination without external interventions, and autonomy in the moral sense, autonomy, autonomy as a moral right to exercise one's capacity for self-determination without external interventions, or perhaps a set of rights aimed at protecting this capacity. And uh, Colette and Lyon Strobel do not question Tuomala's assumption that when one enters the joint project in the we mode, one's autonomy in the first sense becomes restricted. And I find that very plausible. Um, I mean, if I enter a joint project, I will make commitments to others and, uh, and I sort of give up on certain other uh, freedoms that I, that I have for, for that joint project. So that seems unproblematic. But they do question whether Tuomala's account does justice to autonomy in the second ethical sense 
So they say it's the second ethical sense of personal autonomy that we argue poses problems for Tuomela's analysis, insofar as a social ontology must at some point be made congruent with, or at least be made not to be incongruent with plausible ethical theory. In response to this complaint, Tuomela admits that his phrase permission to leave the group may have been misleading and he points out that he is talking about cases where leaving the group may harm the other members. And he also uh, mentioned that he has proposed in his 2013 book that sometimes mere informing the other members might be appropriate. So asking for permission may amount to nothing more than informing the others that one is about to leave. So he weakens the claim, or he tries to make clear that it is weaker than it may sound. Nevertheless, he also admits that the critics to some extent are right in the sense that in, in his account, the members of a well-functioning remote group can be said somewhat figuratively to have given up part of their autonomy and self-determination to their remote group. So is that ethically problematic. The norms restricting a member's right to leave or to abandon the group ethos are social norms. And I think that Tuomala could have responded um, along these lines instead. This is not Tuomala's line of defense in his 2017 response, but a natural line of defense, I think. So what he says is that the member group normatively ought to accept the group ethos and the member group normatively ought to ask for permission. From this, nothing follows about the existence or non-existence or justification of rights and obligations that exist beyond the rights and obligations created within the group. So it could be the case that while the member is not group normatively allowed to leave the group without permission, she may be legally allowed or morally allowed or even morally obliged to do so. Corlett and Lyon Strobel finds it somewhat ironic that Tuomla mentions mafia groups in the context of groups having a morality absent a universalized ethics. And, and they say that he seems not to notice that his analysis of remote groups bears a striking similarity to mafia groups in the manner in which is suggested herein. But I, I don't see this, this irony. On the contrary, it seems to me that a plausible account of collectivity in the strong sense should capture all kinds of tightly knitted, knitted groups and mafia groups and prison gang gangs may be paradigmatic examples of such groups. So even if they are not honorable or ethical. To sum up, since Tuomala's theory is silent on which moral rights we have and has no implications about which moral norms that are plausible, it cannot be incongruent with plausible ethical theory as far as I can see. So before I continue, a brief digression about what I mean with social norms <coughs> and uh, group norms and group normativity, uh, which I believe is also roughly what, what Tuomala means. So, so social norms, according to a fairly standard view, exist within a certain social group and apply to the members of that group. They involve shared expectations about should or should not be done in different types of social situations. These expectations can be both as Piquieri says, empirical, they can be about what one expects other people to do, or normative, they can be what one, about what one expects other people to think that one should do. Social norms typically involve a 
a sense of accountability and the possibility of sanctions against breaches. And social norms need not be ethical or useful. They can be harmful, they can be inefficient, they can be immoral. And I think that this characterization of social norms is compatible with what Tuomala says. He, he stresses uh, mutual expectations with normative entailments. He stresses that um, sanctions may be in place for members who exit the group without permission, etc. Corlett and Lyon Strobel are not unaware that Tuomala leaves the question of how to account for ethical normativity open. They stress this. They think, though, that he owes us an account of ethical normativity. So this is what they say. The Tuomala's theory can accommodate the social, but is not designed to accommodate the moral rights that we motors have within groups, including the right to unilaterally exit a group, is not a plausible defense of his view against our concern. Part of our criticism is that his social ontology is incapable of accommodating some basic moral facts, such as moral rights to unilaterally exit a we mode group one has joined in concert with others. And they add that this points to the glaring problem with his social ontology. It fails to provide an analysis of social groups that can make sense of at least some of the vital concepts of ethical normativity. So can Tuomala's theory accommodate ethical normativity? I think this depends on what the term accommodate is taken to me. His theory certainly allows for the possibility of ethical normativity and Tuomala never questions its existence, the existence of moral norms. But one might ask whether Tuomala's theory provides us with the conceptual tools to ex explicate ethical normativity, even if this is clearly beyond Tuomala's own ambitions. In their criticism of Tuomala, Corlett and Lyon Strobel assume for the sake of this paper that some versions of moral realism and moral rights realism are sound. I find that a bit surprising. I think that if one claims that Tuomala owes us an account of ethical normativity, the account of ethical normativity that one would have in mind would be an account where social attitudes play an essential role. That would be, in my view, that would be an account closer to a Jumean or Strawsonian expressivist account of morality than to moral realism and moral rights realism. Such accounts focus, social attitudes, what Strawson calls reactive attitudes, and Jung's uh, paradigmatic examples of such attitudes are pride and humility, love and hatred. And I think that given the nature of Tuomala's project, uh, it, it, it might be interesting to ask whether his, his, his um, analysis could help develop accounts of, of the latter kind. And I actually do think that there are several elements in Tuomala's social ontology that would fit well in with a human or Strawsonian view of the nature of morality. Tuomala's own view of ethical normativity is not clear from his work as, as, as I have said, and uh, as has been stressed, he explicitly leaves it out of his account. In some places, he refers to ethical normativity as opposed to group normativity as Kantian or universalizable. And he also says, at least in one place, that his own view of ethics is functionalist and pragmatist, Pragma pra pragmatic or pragmatist. I think that the latter admission, at least, might be compatible with 
a development along the lines I would suggest. So first, um, one thing that would fit with such an account is Tuomala's analysis of the role of we mode thinking in potential social dilemmas. Um, Hume famously distinguishes between natural virtues such as benevolence, a spring, spring from feelings like love and sympathy. They vary with personal relations. They are not rigid or universalizable. But he also talks about artificial virtues such as justice and property rights, which are, as he says, inflexible and apply to friends and enemies alike. The norms governing these virtues are universalizable. Hume's basic explanation of how such norms can be established is that they enable us to transform choice situations that would have been genuine dilemmas without them. Jung would have agreed, I think, with Tuomela that, quote, social institutions, and I think that uh, artificial virtues in Hume's sense fits Tuomela's description of social institutions. Social institutions typically have as their general goal or at least function to create order in society by solving coordination problems and collective action problems involving conflict between individual and collective rationality." End of quote. Hume has been credited for anticipating several insights of game theory, and he has been called the true founding father of game theory by Bing Mott, for instance. And this literature typically stresses Hume's introduction of the notion of convention and his explanations of why certain conventions are favored in situations where other strategies for interaction could have been developed and sustained. So his treatment of conventions has been praised and analyzed in the game theoretical context. However, I think that notably little weight has been given to the possible role of Hume's concept of a general sense of common interest. The question of how this concept should be understood and fitted into Hume's informally game theoretical framework has not received much attention. And one reason for why this is so why this claim tends to be downplayed, you, this claim by you, it, uh, could be that it may seem to threaten the conventional game theoretical reading of you in a fundamental way by bringing in collectivistic motivations in a manner alien to orthodox game theory. From an exegetical point of view, I think that downplaying the role of the general sense of common interest in Hume's theory seems questionable, in part because he explicates conventions in terms of the general sense of common interest. So this is a quote. This convention is not the nature of a promise, for even promises themselves, as we shall see afterwards, arise from human conventions. It is only a general sense of common interest, which sends all the members of the society expressed to one another, and which induces in them, which induces them to regulate their conduct by certain rules. I suggest that we take literally Hume's declaration that the convention in question is basically only a general sense of common interest. It's this social feature of individual agents that is supposed to do the essential explanatory work. On this reading of Hume, he would not only be a pioneer in discussing prisoners and their structured games and related problems, by suggesting that individuals have a basic capacity to conceive of these situations from the community's perspective, that they have a sense of the collective. He's also foreshadowing recent collectivistic approaches to these problems. An understanding of Jung's general sense of common interest in terms of a we mode or a we perspective would make sense of the idea that this capacity of ours enable us to avoid social dilemmas and solve coordination problems in line with how Tuomala thinks of the role of the we mode. A second feature of you, the Jungian explanation of 
the universalizable rigid part of morality is his insistence that these practices can evolve without any explicit agreements or promises, just like when two persons start rowing a boat together and gradually find the optimal coordination. I think that this could fit well in with other Tuomelian ideas, for instance, his ideas about the role of pattern governed behavior and collective acceptance for social institutions. Such behavior, says Tuomela, is typically not intentional, but it can be purposeful and meaningful. I don't have the ambition to develop a Tuomelian to, to theory of morality, but I think that such an account should be devel developed in the human tradition with a focus on remote thinking, collective acceptance, social attitudes, social conventions. Thank you very much for listening. Bye.